Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Miguel Amado. I am the director of Sirius Art Center. Uh, Sirius Art Center is an organization based in Cove, uh, County Cork. And um, I am joined in this uh, Zoom meeting with, by my colleague, Brian McDonald, and by Connor, who is our guest speaker, and everyone else who um, is with us. Um, so at Sirius Art Center, we, 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 we've been trying to um, develop a series of programs that um, enable us and the communities we work with and beyond um, to engage in discussions around the world in which we live, the conditions and uh, that we are operating within, um, within the context of the pandemic, but beyond that as well. And um, we, um, I'm, I moved to Cork uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm originally from Portugal and I was based in the UK. And I became aware of this uh, figure called William Thompson, who uh, I, I became aware of his work because he was a precursor to Karl Marx, some of the writings uh, on the capital, particularly around uh, questions of uh, use value and other uh, concepts. And I became intrigued with the fact that there was this legacy of progressive thinking and practice in Cork, um, which of course has had different manifestations and also different scholars have been working around. So at Sirius, we thought that would be interesting to use uh, this legacy to initiate a new series of conversations <clears throat> around themes that we found are urgent, current issues that are urgent to address and uh, we also believe we are addressing these through um, inviting uh, people, scholars, academics, um, activists, community organizers, artists whose work we believe in or we share. Um, and we, we, in, that's, that's where we are. So this is the first of a series of uh, programs that we are organizing. Um, we are now in our schedule, we have five events one per month between now and the middle of the summer. And potentially this will be a program that will continue beyond that. So this is our pilot. I, uh, uh, well, having moved to Ireland and coming from South Europe, one of the striking questions that has always intrigued me is the fact that in some context, Ireland is seen as a tax haven for uh, particularly international techno technological corporations. And the fact that I also found that the policy around me is pretty much neoliberal or following the neoliberal agenda that was set up in the 70s and the 80s. And, um, but also on the other hand, there are different uh, um, support structures operating at the community level or other levels that I were also of interest to me that I could only realize um, are when I moved. So nothing better than having someone like Connor who has been uh, devoting his work, to, a lot of his work to the questions surrounding the financial system in Ireland and beyond, questions, more philosophical questions around money. Um, I became aware of his book called Money published uh, not long ago, and I also attended one of his uh, workshops a few, maybe two years ago, organized by a colleague of mine, Fiona Woods, an artist based in Limerick. Um, interestingly, there's another book by Connor who I also encountered where he speaks about similar things, but, uh, and by reading that passage of that book, I started to understand much more the reality in which I was. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have Connor joining us and be our first uh, guest speaker in this series. Um, so as I mentioned, Connor is a, is a, is a researcher, um, works a lot with uh, community groups, labor organizations, um, and, other, and, and other constituents who are trying to put forward uh, a progressive agenda. And his latest book is called Money. And today is going to discuss some of his views on the relationship, complex relationship between uh, finance, financial system and Ireland. I won't spend much more time introducing Connor. I will let him do this uh, himself. And I look forward to hearing his thoughts. We will, we hope to have, of course, time for discussion. And um, we are recording this session um, with the intent of uploading it onto Sirius uh, YouTube channel so that it can be shared widely after, after, after today. 
Okay, Connor, I end over to you now. Okay, so thanks very much, and thanks for everyone for for uh, fucking showing along. Um, I, I just need to be made host, I think, for for share screen. Yes. Just so I can. Um, it's already done. Yep. Oh, perfect, Grant. Okay. So, um, okay, so can, uh, can, uh, can people see that? Yes. Perfect. Um, let's go from the beginning. Okay, so it's not actually giving me much more than this. I, I can, I, 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 I can people see that slide anyway? Can they? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, thanks to the William uh, Alec Thompson uh, Forum for this opportunity to uh, to talk. Um, I'm going to try and cover um, if a few things. One is money itself, and then also kind of um, Ireland's kind of position in. In, in the global in the global kind of financial system and then also how that kind of affects us in terms of kind of um uh, social ireland and and other forms um of of the guards of our um of our society so the first thing really is to is really kind of delve into this thing called uh, money so um but when we usually think of money, or when I usually hear people talk about it, they talk about it as as a thing, because we we um, um, experience money as a thing, as notes or coins or kind of balance sheets, um, and and this and this is kind of summed up by John Galbraith, who you know who who, who has this quote called a, a, called that the process by which money is the created is so simple that the mind is repelled that we sometimes hear this or you know if we google kind of money you'll hear people or kind of see people yeah, say that it's made out of thin air it's not real it's all about trust and 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 like so forth um i don't hold to those views um i put forward a very different view of what money is and a a, a kind of money system. So for me, money is a social technology and has been a pivotal one in the history of human society. So when we think of, of money, it's more like writing or more like kind of mathematics. Um, when money starts to emerge in complex kind of societies, it's usually around when cities are, are being kind of developed. And this is kind of all across the globe. So when we lose that kind of one-on-one -on -one kind of contact, uh, people uh, or, or, or people and, and like societies, they develop credit systems. And then out of, and then out of these um, out of these out of these out of these kind of systems comes what we see now as as money. But it is a system and it's a way of kind of moving around social wealth. Um, for for highly complex human societies, um, so how we experience money today is in a kind of capitalist system. So really, uh, what we see is kind of that capitalism did not invent money; it didn't um, invent a deep kind of money system. It's more an invasion of that kind of money system that was already there. So it then takes what are kind of complex kind of human kind of technologies and, and then it shapes it to its own logic so so when we deal with money today we're dealing with it where it's been shaped through a capitalist logic um, and that's the real difference with kind of money systems from the past and like money systems today and then hopefully um in terms of um al um alternatives for kind of money, you know, for kind of money systems in the future. So as kind of Ingram says here, um, the power of money is not just found in like um, wealth, uh, but it's also in uh, the power to control the production of money in like key kind of institutions such as central banks, mints, um, uh, mints and kind of uh, private banks as well. That really when we talk about kind of power of money in in the capitalist system is the power to kind of decide where investment goes so what gets invested in and what doesn't get invested in 
And for one example, from kind of recent Irish history, if you look at um, like Irish banks that were kind of bailed out in the bank guarantee of, 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 of kind of 2008, um, the bank, bank lending in Ireland, um, both internal and external, because Irish banks, they were lending to kind of developers in Britain, in like New York, in Dubai. Um, but their loans went from around 100 billion to around 400 billion in the case of like eight years. So what we see in Ireland is the greatest misallocation of capital investment in the state's history, because where that money went in terms of Ireland was into kind of hotels, golf clubs, the commercial kind of buildings and, and housing as well, and kind of goes to kind of estates. But I use that just as one example of, this is also a power of a kind of money system is what gets chosen as an investment. And then what gets chosen goes back to the capitalist logic. So it's that which will give a kind of high return or a kind of high profit. So it's not about what's best for kind of society, but, a, 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 but it's, it, it's about what's best for the owners of that capital in terms of their own kind of return. And in Ireland, uh, due to tax breaks and other kind of, um, like, and, and other kind of uh, systems, um, property was seen as the big kind of investment. So that's where this, this kind of wealth, it, you know, it kind of went into. So when we deal with money, that where that's kind of credit and money may appear to be kind of created out of thin air, it's only possible there because it falls on a very robust social and like legal system. Um, it's a bit like law. Um, somebody could say, and you have kind of heard this, that law is just words. All it is, is, is just words. Well, it's not. What gives law its power is the, is the kind of coercive element in the legal system. If you do not play by the rules, there are kind of consequences. Same with a money system. Uh, you try paying your ESB bill with love. Um, it's just not, it just, it just won't happen. So there's a very strong and coercive element. Try paying rent in, in anything apart from like a currency. You cannot pay your taxes in Ireland in anything apart from euros. Um, so there's a very strong and coercive element that keeps that money system going. And this is kind of, for me, it's, it's quite important because um, it shows that that kind of view of money as being, out of, uh, as being kind of made out of thin air. It's true in the same way that we can make words here, like today, brand new words out of kind of thin air, but it won't be law unless they're passed by a parliament and, they're, and then they're kind of uh, judged on by judges. We can, we, can, we, can, we can create a kind of credit system, but it's, it's, it's what kind of social kind of import will be weakened by its kind of coercive kind of abilities or, or kind of lack of them. So to, to kind of sum up, um, when we deal with money systems, uh, money itself, it's a social technology that rests there upon very kind of robust social, economic, legal, um, and political and like cultural systems, um, which, which do not develop overnight. These develop over hundreds of years. Um, and in our system, they give light to very deep, unequal power, 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 power relationships. Um, so we have this thing called as money that's a kind of um, it that captures socially kind of generated wealth that leads to an, an unequal kind of distribution of that wealth down to kind of property rights on that profit, on claims on, on that profit. So in summary, <laughs> um, and I'm sorry for being kind of so uh, quick on something that is kind of highly kind of complex, but money falls on trust, but also falls on the coercion and it needs both. To last anything longer than, you know, a, a kind of few years, it needs kind of both of these things. And if it doesn't have them, 
then you won't have, you may have money, but you won't have a kind of money system. So those who control the rules, those who get to write the rules, are in a very strong kind of position in terms of any kind of society. And if that's not kind of democratic, then that's got issues for your kind of money system. If the rules and how they're being set, what gets invested in, what doesn't, if that doesn't have democratic kind of oversight, then your money system won't either. So to jump quite quickly into Ireland, um, where does Ireland kind of fit in this then? So where, um, as, as kind of Miguel kind of uh, pointed out, um, Ireland is a hub in the global kind of financial system. And its role is really as a offshore kind of financial center. Um, this is a map from the Irish kind of funds industry. It's about, it's about eight or 10 years old now, but I, but I haven't found um, an image uh, as kind of clear as this that's been kind of updated. This would have been around just after the bank crisis, but you're dealing there with around $2.5 trillion in assets that are under administration in Ireland. It's around $5 trillion now. And where this kind of comes from um, really dates from the 1980s with the setting up of the Irish Financial Services Centre in like 1987. Um, that very quickly got a kind of name as a, as a tax haven. Um, even, even the phrasing of the very first kind of brochure for it, Ireland as a haven for financial banking and financial services. So it's making clear as to what is, is being sold here. Uh, by 2005, um, you, you can just see there um, at the bottom, this is from the New York Times, but Dublin was known as the Wild West of, kind of European finance because what Ireland sold, and I'll, 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 um, I'll, touch, I'll touch on this kind of later on, is that what Ireland sells is not just a low kind of tax rate, but a very weak oh, um, but coercive system. Um, Ireland has a kind of we don't don't ask don't tell type of type of type of kind of approach to kind of transnational capital when it kind of lands in in um, in Ireland. There are some jobs in this, and the, there's a few thousand, which sounds big, and it is, but in the context of 2.2 million people working in Ireland, it, it is quite niche. And it is quite centred. Uh, it's mainly Dublin, parts of Kilkenny, parts of Galway, but that's what you're dealing with here. I am um, Cork. I I think there's there's some elements in in Cork, but it's actually still kind of quite weak. It's it, it's mainly Dublin, and then kind of Kilkenny, um, and then parts of like Galway then as well. So many of these kind of funding vehicles have no employees in Dublin, and and are managed uh, somewhere else. And these funds are here mainly to shrink their tax bills. So it's always been quite known. This is from writers from 2014, I think. Um, but it's always been kind of quite known as to what Ireland is doing with the finance tax element of it. Uh, maybe in the questions there afterwards, I might kind of uh, tease out at a difference with your kind of factory tax kind of breaks, with your Apple kind of factory stuff. And then there's your Apple finance stuff, which actually it's got nothing to do with kind of jobs kind of whatsoever. It's just kind of accountancy. Um, so what goes on? I mean, this is from a brochure by Arthur Cox uh, Law Firm. And uh, this is again from around, this is actually from 2007 or eight. And when I started using this image, they actually took it from their brochure. <laughs> so, um, so, this, so they, they, they actually kind of took this down. But, but this is kind of Arthur Cox, and this was a brochure for a special purpose vehicle, set one up in Ireland. And a special purpose vehicle is basically, it's a, it's a tax avoidance kind of structure. And this is their image. This is how they see Ireland. Uh, like finance kind of comes in, it's washed over as tax, and then it goes straight back out again. Um, this is in part, this is part of what we get into with the like leprechaun economics and Ireland's kind of GDP. That's the greatest work of fiction since like Ulysses. Um, it's just, it just, you know, it's just, it, it is kind of, it, it's so kind of made up. 
So what are we dealing with here? Now, how it's sold in terms of kind of politicians is, you know, that this is a handy number, it's a bit of a mixer. You know, that's the kind of way that it's kind of put forward. Sure, it does no harm. Um, in terms of, of, of like what it's worth, here we can see that like there's around a five trillion, uh, five trillion uh, euros worth of shadow banking that's on paper being listed as being kind of in Ireland. Um, and the SPVs alone, just, just these kind of parts of them, they're only like less than one fifth of the business. They brought in around 400 million in fees for a very small number of kind of legal firms and kind of currency firms in, in Ireland. So when you, so when you ask that question, uh, qui bono, who, who, who benefits here? Um, this is this is who kind of benefits. Um, it's mainly kind of legal firms. It's kind of county firms, um, and that's that's pretty much it for for this kind of financial shuffling of paper element there to it. Now, shadow banking means just that uh, we don't actually know what goes in, what goes on there. So uh, we know that uh, there's a there is some corruption that goes on. There was a case back in 2015, I'll just click on it here now, where um, there was around 300 million in payments coming from um, Uzbekistan that were found just kind of lodged in kind of accounts in like Ireland. But this is a, um, um, a report that was done by two, two kind of academics based in, in like Trinity College where they talk about Ireland as a safe haven. So they go into just what is going on in the financial services center. And uh, there's a lot of kind of shell companies which cannot be traced back to their real kind of owners. So even though the vast kind of bulk of it will be legal, um, because one of the joys of being able to, to set the laws is, why would you, if, if you can write the laws, why would you make what you want to do illegal? So a lot of what happens in Ireland is legal because you get to set the laws. Even in that, though, there is some kind of corruption kind of going on. There are kind of but other elements that are going on in, in terms of kind of money laundering. Um, so up to now, what would normally happen if there was a politician here? is that they would go, well, sure, it's a handy number. This is just, this is good for Ireland Inc., that phrase, and like so forth. Well, in, in order for Ireland to be a tax haven, um, it can't make exceptions for these companies. So since 1997, um, the, special, the special tax zones in Ireland, such as the Shannon and... And the IFSC, they had to be shut down. Um, just the EU just wasn't having it there anymore. Um, so what Ireland did was that it turned all of Ireland into a low tax tax haven kind of system. So instead of shutting down the Shannon Economic Zone offshore kind of system, or shutting down IFSC, it turned Ireland's tax law into offshore the entire kind of uh, country. So what that means now is that um, Ireland's kind of local corporation tax can't be, it can't have one rate for IFSC companies. It's, it's one rate for all companies in Ireland. So after the Troika showed up in like 2010, uh, the IMF said, uh, said to Ireland, you could probably lessen austerity if you were to shut down some of these kind of tax loops or raise kind of corporation tax. And the state said, no, uh, we'll have more austerity and we'll keep this rate. Um, so much so that like, I, I have to admit, I find it very, very strange how the corporation tax rate has such a grip on the national kind of narrative in Ireland. It's bordering on like bizarre. And I just don't, and I just don't mean from a right wing kind of point of view. Um, I'd find it almost impossible to argue for some reform of Ireland's kind of corporation tax system in, in the trade union movement, um, or even in kind of parties, even in kind of left wing parties. Um, 
it's very, very difficult. It's just gotten a grip on the Irish kind of psyche. Um, so much so that you had uh, James Riley, who was Minister for Health at the time, saying that our corporate tax rate is sacrosanct. So it's actually, you know, it's, it's kind of religious kind of doctrine. You know, it's a, very, it's a very strange thing to be saying about a tax rate. When I go into about how this kind of pays off, um, around 68% of all companies in Ireland pay zero corporation tax. That's Irish companies and kind of foreign companies. Going back to that change in 1997. Um, so all Irish companies can avail of the kind of tax loops which Apple uses and which, and which kind of Microsoft can use. So Greencore, um, which would be one of the largest um, black Irish companies, um, it's a multi-billion kind of company, pays very low, pays almost zero kind of corporation tax. Um, uh, CRH, uh, Cement and Rollstone, same thing, pays very little kind of corporation tax. Um, and because our investment strategy, even for Irish companies, is the corporation tax, that means that indigenous Irish companies have a real problem in terms of the type of kind of supports they need. So if you look at, um, I don't want to, I, I, I just want to, I, I realized that I, I might end up going on a tangent here. Sorry. Okay. I'll just kind of keep this kind of quick. If you look at the COVID kind of supports, um, going back to that kind of mentality there around kind of corporation tax, um, the three of the biggest kind of um, drains on any kind of Irish, on any non-exporting Irish company is insurance costs, uh, rents, uh, and rates. These are the three kind of drains, also kind of wages, but it's mainly kind of uh, rents and and like insurance, um, oh, well, and, and like bank loans, you know. Um, the government does very little to tackle these, these, uh, these, um, these involuntary costs um, because it's put everything into kind of corporation tax. But the like, corporation tax only makes, only pays off if you're making enough profit to actually kind of benefit then from that. So it's very skewed towards kind of multinationals. Um, so Ireland has a very good kind of track rate in, in startups. We're actually quite good at it. Um, but the startups tend to get bought out before they become really kind of export led. So we almost breed our, our companies for export, same as the cattle back in the 1950s. And uh, so that's, these are where we get into the, the problems we're having this kind of corporation tax kind of fetish um, those other kind of supports just aren't don't really get a big kind of look in but also there's a there's a social cost because of not tackling kind of corporation tax or tackling insurance costs um, like there was there was 28 billion that was taken out of kind of social kind of supports from 2008 until 2013 these are the costs of keeping this kind of corporation tax at like 12.5 percent um, we're still suffering from them. So um, I wrote a, 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 a report there for Unite there last month called Hungry Berries on, um, are not equal to kind of full bellies. And it's really, it was, it, it's mainly to kind of tackle the kind of um, media kind of narrative that, um, that Ireland is getting more equal. The, have people heard that? Did you hear that on in it was in kind of Irish Times and like RTA? It's it's nonsense. But we're still kind of we're still suffering in terms of those kind of social kind of cuts, even though they were they were six, eight years ago. Um it also gets into a wider one because Ireland is a block on real reform, even at an EU level. So you have um even as something as simple as a digital tax, which would be a, a tax of around 0. Point, I, I think it's 0. 0.01% 0. 0. is what is being kind of muted on every kind of financial transaction that happens. And Ireland is, is one of two or three companies that is just saying, no, we are, we are blocking this. Um, and, and, and also Ireland also blocks um, transparency laws, uh, which means that um, 
companies have to list where profits are made in like in which company or in like which countries. Um, so again, even not a kind of global justice kind of level, Ireland is a block at these things. There are murmurings coming out of kind of Biden's um, uh, administration. They want to raise corporation tax anyway and bring in a, a, a kind of standard kind of tax um, for all kind of US companies, even kind of for, even where they're based in Ireland. Um, but Ireland is still kind of blocking it. Now, why is that? If it's, you know, like what's the real kind of, why would it go this far? Because this has nothing to do with the 12.5% kind of rate. Well, what Ireland trades again is its tax code. So what tax havens don't, don't really deal that kind of 1960s view of kind of tax havens where it's it, people just put their billions into kind of offshore kind of accounts. That's part of it. But really what Ireland sells is, is like legislation where we don't really check stuff and we allow certain products to be based in, in, in Ireland that would not be based in kind of other countries. Like there was a certain, there was a, there was a, there was a local government a mortgage bond that was banned in Germany in the early 2000s and the PDs changed the law to allow it to be set up here. Um, a, a one of those banks was Defa Bank and Defa Bank ended up costing the German taxpayer around 100 billion because it just blew up after the bank crash in 2008. So much so that even the financial services law uh, textbook, the main kind of textbook uh, that's used in, in, in Ireland, Buckingham and Finmar Murphy, talks about this, about how it's one thing having this local and corporate kind of tax rate, but it's another just setting yourself up as a tax haven, or uh, as he says, as a, safe ha as a safe haven in terms of tax, because the establishment doesn't like Ireland to be called a tax haven. So they've, they've kind of, they, they, they use kind of other kind of, uh, Raises there for it. And then finally, just on this kind of part, because my purpose here is, is really just to say that when we talk about money and like money systems and kind of alternatives, we, I think we have to kind of bring in these kind of elements as well. But even in terms of, um, of, of global warming, so going back to that kind of thing around the enormous power that banks have to allocate investment funds is absolutely staggering. So since the Paris climate deal, there's around $3.8 trillion in finance has been given over to um, coal, oil, and gas firms. Um, so just despite what has been signed, um, the amount of funds that has been used to still prop up what is causing kind of global uh, what is causing kind of global warming is absolutely staggering. So I mean, like it would take less than one trillion to completely revolutionise um, energy and transport in the entire EU, not just the um, but eurozone. It costs around I think it's around I've seen figures. There's different figures but it goes from 600 million up to maybe 1.2 trillion. So a, a, a fraction of the amount of funds that is being used here. And that would, that would completely revolutionize the entire EU in terms of being kind of carbon neutral, of actually building carbon neutral energy systems, transport systems, um, housing as, as well. But it's not being done. And the ECB, which could do this, isn't, isn't going into it. It's, it's still locked into giving kind of brand new credit over to kind of private banks who then use it for, for these kind of purposes. So we need alternatives. And um, there's one thing I've learned from doing kind of talks like these. Uh, you have to, like, what's the solution here? And uh, for me, it's, it's, there are kind of short term things that we can do in terms of like state banks and kind of ECB kind of roles. Um, but I think what we really need is to really kind of tackle that, that kind of normative consensus, that way of seeing kind of money systems. So that kind of capitalist logic 
for me, that's what really needs to be kind of tackled. That they really need to really kind of look outside of the bubble, that kind of capitalist kind of bubble that we are in, and actually look out at that what would kind of non-capitalist forms of money could look like. What would non-capitalist forms of credit kind of look like? And it's not just about the kind of credit form because it's it's a social technology. It means to really transform that social technology. And for me, where I find a lot of kind of inspiration is in kind of feminist economics. I find this so rich in terms of kind of ideas. So you have kind of Mary Meller, who's, who's really clear on this. Um, there's kind of eco-feminism and then there's feminism for uh, the kind of 90%. And, and they deal with kind of social reproduction. How do we bring in kind of feminists um, feminist ideas into that kind of social technology to actually kind of shape it through. Um, as an example, normally when economists talk about the state or, or kind of GDP, there's kind of, there's income from interest and fees, there's income from human labor, that's wages, and then there's income from the sale of goods and, and, and like services. This is your share of the, of the national income. But what it doesn't bring in is things like global, like global kind of capital, the environment, and also social reproduction, which is like care work, uh, child rearing, um, um, old care as well. All these other things that are socially necessary, but which the capitalist money system does not like to really pay for via kind of taxation doesn't really like it. So it so just dumps the cost of that on, onto, kind of ordinary, onto ordinary people's uh, uh, like shoulders. Um, to really kind of make the thesis out that when we look at kind of capitalism, it tends to be in this way. And I think that what kind of feminist economics does is that it helps us to start seeing it kind of this way. So we start to see that, that behind kind of capitalism's Official, kind of, official institutions of, of wage, labor, production, exchange, and finance stand all these necessary kind of supports and enabling kind of conditions. In many ways, what keeps kind of society going is in spite of this kind of capitalist kind of machine, not really kind of because of it. But we've been so conditioned in the thinking that everything comes from the capitalism. It's like it's the it's the it's the it's the braggart in the class who says I did that. That was me. Who just like takes claim for everything, <laughs> and just everyone else kind of does the work. And he just says, no, no, no. You know, this was me. You know, fuck off, like you know. So a lot of how kind of, of like a lot of the way that our societies operate is actually in non-capitalist ways. And, and, and the capitalism needs them. It's not something that it, just, it, it, that, it, that it just kind of tolerates. If capitalism had to pay for the costs of the environment and, and the cost of social reproduction, it could not operate. It could not operate as a capitalist system. It needs to exploit these two elements here in order to function. It is extractive of this kind of wealth. So there's a battle that is going on constantly. And when we see this is in terms of care, uh, in terms of um, in Ireland kind of child rearing, creches, um, how, how there is a, a complete block on any kind of state kind of creche kind of system, which just makes sense, same as the national school system, just have it the very same system, but for creches. Um, in terms of housing, how like housing has been kind of financialized um, where the main kind of, the large kind of landlords are, are like coming in. This is from 20, 2019. And in 2019, of the 21,000 new homes, that's flats and houses, that were built that year, only 8,000 were put on sale in the open market. And the other 15,000, no, the, like the other kind of 13,000 ended up being bought off plans by, by corporate investors. So who then like start kind of renting uh, the milk because people just don't have the funds to buy them. And also in terms of, of water, where you tried to like privatize, not so much 
Eduardo system with a payment from it. And that was and that was kind of defeated. So to finish up, because I really just want to tease out kind of questions more than kind of anything else, but there's a really good article here by kind of Mary Meller, and, and I might just send her on a, a to kind of Miguel um, because it's it, it's a paywall where she deals with what would a kind of post-capitalist eco-feminist money system actually look like. And like, no, she's really kind of worked kind of very, you know, kind of very strongly on this. So she says that if a public money system is to operate as a mechanism of ecological sustainability and social justice, we need to socialize and democratize the production of, of money. So what, what she's kind of getting at here, and this gets into a wider thing around kind of organization, but instead of how do we how do we democratize change? It's really how do how do we make change democratic? How do you organize to make these things that they are kind of so that you do not end up with this type of a situation where you have nearly four trillion dollars in bank funds supporting um the destruction of the environment when one quarter of that could could just in 10 years revolutionize um all of europe and that's just kind of europe there alone so when there is a blockage it's because this system is not actually under democratic control it could be but it's not so these are these are these are these are some of the things that i think really should be kind of teased out so we can end up with our wonderful eco-feminist nirvana which is where i want to live in and um i'll leave it there okay okay connor thank you so much for a fantastic introduction to such a complex narrative I mean, I am more shocked than I could have been. Uh, not that I was not maybe so much familiar with some of the things that you said, but it's quite impressive to see the extent of the uh, of like the state um, being complicit with this sort of mechanism. Mm. Um, so I only will ask you one question, and I will open up to everyone sure. else. Um, but my question to you would be, um, I mean, it's it's very rich, very layered. You know, we could start unpacking small everything point almost point by point. Yeah. But I would like to ask you, where do you trace the genealogy? Why, like in history, where do you feel this drive of the republic of the state towards the drive towards this status quo of today? Where do you where do you where do you see it beginning? What's kind of the what are the what is the ideology or history that is behind this? Yeah, I mean, like for me, it it goes back to the twelfth and thirteenth century. You know, so you have this kind of stop starts from the Italian kind of city uh, states of the twelfth and the thirteenth century, um, who are where, where they're starting to kind of play around with these ideas of how to how to monetize. Um, Human labor and like social wealth, um, it 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 then kind of shifts to uh, Holland in the in the fifteenth kind of century, as uh, and kind of sixteenth century, and then Britain and then uh, Portugal, which is a huge role in it, um, in terms of kind of global capital because of the slave trade. Um, like this is built on slavery. It's built on 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 the on the kind of um, Atlantic kind of slave trade. Um, but so from around the early late 16th, early 17th kind of century, um, London is looking at kind of Antwerp and it's looking at Alec like Holland and just going, we want to copy these people. You know, how do we do this? So, you, so you get into the kind of English kind of civil war and and um, and the like King Billy, uh, he was still kind of celebrated here. Um, but but that kind of great kind of compromise, the the glorious, the glorious revolution of of England 
um, is is that con- is that can compromise there between old money, which was in land, and the new money, which was in trade and and like finance, and they and and they were so powerful, um, those kind of traders that they installed their own king, and uh, brought him over from from Holland, um, had a ha- had a short war on it, and. Um, Establish it true. So when you get the kind of the London, the kind of city, the Bank of England being kind of set up, what you see there is that um, the state is essential to capitalism as a system because when it implodes, it's the state that that can only the state is big enough to kind of step in and save it from itself. Um, the Italian the Italian kind of city states weren't big enough. Scotland wasn't either. Like Scotland gets born in the in the South Sea bubble, in in the late kind of seventeenth, early eighteenth century. That leads to the seventeen oh seven Act of Union, which is really to kind of bail out kind of Scotland after the South Sea bubble burst. Um, But England's big enough. It has it has that trade. It has the, the 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 kind of slave trade. Um, you know, so it's big enough to absorb those losses, and, that, and that's where you really see it kind of taken off. Um, so I say all that because we're dealing with something that is hundreds of years old, and it took hundreds of years to develop. It didn't just happen since 1945, and because of that, we're dealing with an ideology that is just seen as being common sense. So how do you challenge common sense? I mean, this is where it gets into really doing your doing kind of your own kind of homework. How do you challenge kind of common sense? Um, so now, like again, just going back to the corporation tax rate, um, you can't make an argument. If you, like if I was to go on RT or something, I, I wouldn't last. I'd be eaten alive, completely eaten alive, because it's just it's just seen as being this is the thing that kind of keeps on going. But that's for another day's work. I mean, I, I can go into the myth around kind of Whitaker and that whole kind of nonsense of there in 1958, but that's for another day's work. But we are dealing with something that has very, very deep roots and has failed and has learned from its failures. And that's what actually makes it strong now is that it, it was able to learn from its kind of mistakes. A great cost, a great kind of social cost, including the deaths of millions in wars. And and slavery, of course. Okay, so would like to ask uh, any question to Connor. You don't need to use the chat. You can just unmute yourselves and uh, and ask a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, sorry, Brenda. I just sorry, I go up as well. Do you want to go first? Oh yeah, it it's sorry. It might sound a little. Well, frivolous, but thank you very much, uh, Connor. That was really uh, a panoramic view of uh, the, the, the whole financial system. Um, and uh, I, I must say, uh, I quite frequently, and I think many people are now looking back at that uh, series um, of uh, Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, which is, is really, uh, seems to me, not ever having been on the inside, to be very, very uh, pinpoint a lot of the cynical values that underpin a lot of what you've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm a huge fan of of kind of yes minister and and yes kind of prime minister. It's absolutely brilliant because. Um, you get that, like, there's one scene in it where you talk about kind of um, Keynes is out and it's Friedman now, you know? And it's really funny because, oh, well, you know, it's just, he's the, he's the new guy, you know? Um, but, it, but also they talk about the empire and like, it's just um, like with kind of Brexit just recently, you know, we can really get a sense of how deeply ingrained that sense of empire is in, in England. Um, I thought I knew England from watching the, the BBC. <laughs> More fool me. I mean, it's just, it's just that whole, this is an empire, you know, like we, 
that's what we do. You know, we we steal stuff and we put it into museums. Mm. Um, so yeah, so like so like it, it's a way of saying that when we're when we're dealing with alternatives to the system, I think we have to kind of recognize that it has it's it's made mistakes and it's kind of bumbled its way through for 800 years, 900 years now. And um, so it it's 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 very robust at the moment for that reason. So so when we kind of think about kind of alternatives, um, it it's it, it's about kind of taking on that kind of that kind of history of it there. We know what pre-capitalist forms of money can look like. Um, we, a, 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 you know, we like we know what non-capitalist forms of money and funds can look like. The challenge for us is for what are post-capitalist forms of that. So what will post-capitalist forms can look like? And I, that's where I find kind of, I find kind of feminist, feminist kind of economics quite rich in that because it doesn't have that, it it doesn't suffer from the from the received wisdom of a patriarchal system, <laughs> which is kind of capitalism. So um, so for me, I I find it just a way of kind of getting in to that logic and starting to kind of dismantle it. Not all kind of feminism now, but it's very much for that, if, like for me, that kind of Marxist kind of feminism. Um, I, I wouldn't be a fan of lean in, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but, but I do think that kind of Marx, the Marxist kind of feminism does, is a very good chisel for chipping away at, at kind of capitalism because it is, it's a racist patriarchal system, you know? Thank you. Sorry, Kevin, did you have something there? Oh. Sure, yeah. No, I'll just go ahead. Um, yeah, no, thanks a million, Connor. It's, as you know, I'm a big fan and I really recommend Connor's books to anybody that um, hasn't read them already. Um, I just wanted to um, just ask on a particular, just, just about the corporation tax, actually, because yeah. um, I think, to my knowledge, um, there are, you know, there, the supranational institutions, you know, for example, I think, as, as to my knowledge, the EU and possibly the OECD have been kind of gunning for Ireland's corporation tax for a while, you know, because it's it's, it's not appreciated that we are such a, a kind of a, a getaway for so many companies that they would, I'm sure, like to accommodate. So do you see that as being inevitable? Is that going to happen? And how do you think Ireland is, is actually going to fare if that does happen? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's a really good question, because um, like just in the last kind of six weeks, um, something that I never thought would happen has happened. Um, a Tory government has announced that it, it's going to raise corporation tax in in, in England, and uh, and 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 Biden in the US has said the uh, same thing as well. So there's so there's arguments over whether it's going to be twenty eight percent or 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 the twenty five percent, but they are going to raise it to pay for the for the COVID kind of crisis. Um, What's worrying for me in terms of Ireland is that there's been no conversation about how we're going to end up paying for this kind of crisis. And we know what they'll do. They'll dump it on our shoulders. That's what they do. And they'll talk about corporation tax as the way forward. Um, most like around, this is from memory, so don't quote me exactly on these figures, but something like 85% of all businesses says, in Ireland are non-exporting businesses. So they live off the kind of internal dynamic of the Irish state and employ around 1.5 million people doing it. Um, like it's a huge kind of um, employer. A low corporation tax is not a big deal for them. It's the insurance costs, it's, it's the rental costs. These are the things that are actually, and it's the bank kind of, it's the bank kind of interest rates. These are the things that are gonna hit them when the COVID kind of vaccine kind of really kind of kicks through. So what are the whole kind of supports there? What we'll hear is that the corporation tax is what keeps Ireland going. I don't believe that. It keeps a part of it going, but it does not keep those non-exporting businesses that are the vast, like them and the kind of public sector are just account for two thirds of all kind of employment. And then, um, you know, that's where the focus needs to be. But that's been a battle in Irish kind of economic planning since the uh, since since the, 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 
the Deacon 1920s, you know, and there's always been that battle there between those who are exporters who want, you know, a low inflation, low investment state. Uh, they're, they're working low wages. And then uh, the rest of us um, who are to, you know, who, who try to kind of struggle through. So I think that like the, like the will, they are kind of up against it. Um, but um, I do think that they will find a way of kind of hanging on to it somehow, you know, uh, because again, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the corporation tax rate per se. That's the selling point there in Ireland. It's the whole kind of legislative apparatus. It's the lack of, of like oversight. That's the real, like five, five trillion. And this, and this, you ask the, the like central bank, what's that five trillion trillion been used for? And they'll say, we don't know. Like, <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, this is twice the size of the, of the UK economy. That's in Ireland. That's been administered here. And nobody knows what it's been used for. Nobody knows it, it just what it's doing, you know? So I think that they'll try and keep that kind of game going. But, but the narrative in the media will be that we must protect the corporation tax rate at, at kind of all costs. And what will happen there is that small businesses and kind of local businesses that don't really need that kind of corporation, local, that local, that local, that low corporation tax rate, doesn't re it's, it's, it's not really their biggest kind of selling point. Um, that's, that's what's going to kill them. But that's the one thing which will not be tackled. Have I answered kind of your question? I just rambled. I think, no, I think you did. No, I you did. Thanks a million. <laughs> Appreciate it. Okay, sorry about that. Um, just following on from that question, like, does Ireland have any choice in actually changing the tax rate if it's changed in America? Because I thought what they were trying to do in America was have two different tax rates, like would say, so if companies in Ireland, that the, the tax on here would be, so does that actually take the choice away from us, or? Yeah, I mean, like, um, like, it, like that's very, good, that's a very good kind of point because a, what they'll do is that um, they're going to bring in a minimum corporate tax rate for for kind of foreign profits or external kind of profits. So under kind of under kind of U.S. kind of tax law, um, all your earnings are subject to kind of U.S. tax, but only when you bring them back in, into a different jurisdiction. So Apple has around kind of one trillion in funds just sitting in various kind of bank accounts all around the world, which which it, which it doesn't kind of bring back to the U.S. because if it does, it'll be kind of taxed. So it's it's actually it's actually gone on an investment strike, and it was actually quite open about this in the hearings back in 2015. It said we're not bringing home any of this money until something is done on on on, on corporation tax. So they're actually being blatant about it in a very kind of um, honest kind of you know kind of US way saying that what's you know give us a tax break and then we'll kind of bring home kind of all these funds what what that means then is that um, a lot of the of the spike the spike in like corporate tax in Ireland and there has been a spike in the last kind of five years we might see that kind of dropping off and then it's about how do you compensate for it um, and what they'll compensate for is they'll they'll cut kind of investment in, in in like social services. I mean, like unless they're challenged. Um, and uh, yeah, so and, and and I say they, I don't just mean Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. This is the state here. So the state is like the parliament is 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 only one part of the state. Uh, the revenue kind of commissioners are actually part of the state but they're not part of the government the the, the 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 central bank is part of the state but not part of 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 government neither is on guard is is on guard on guard on guard on guard on guard who do not who do not investigate white collar crime to any big extent you know so 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 like when I say the 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 state there's obviously there's those who write the legislation, but then there's other aspects of the state that are purposely not subject to any kind of democratic oversight. It's like it's it's incredible. Like the entire the entire legal system 
where's the democratic and oversight? It's their own boards that decide whether yeah. a lawyer will be kind of um, fired or not. Same as kind of medicine, you know. So, so that's what I mean about the estate, you know. Um, so I think it does put pressure on them. But I do think that they might kind of invest more in those aspects of the more kind of loose stuff. Bank I, I, I'd agree with you. There's like um, a very strong kind of pull in the Irish psychic about that we have to keep uh, yeah. uh, this uh, taxing. And it's, you know, it's from uh, decades long of it from coming through politicians and also the media, the media. You know, uh, you know, you never hear it exposed on the media. The media, uh, you know, uh, uh, along with the politicians and the state, keep this up all the time. So you find, like, like you said, a lot of people. There's that kind of, you know, they're like all through the Celtic Tiger. It was built on that. Oh yeah, that's why we're successful because we've got an open economy. We've got, uh, you know, lax uh, uh, tax, and now that's the kind of la last bit of it hanging on in there. Where we can't let that go. Like you know, this is like there's that's still being kept up like and it is like there is a lot of there's a kind of fear among ordinary people like oh yeah maybe that's the last thing if we yeah if we that that's it then like you know we've got nothing else like you know this kind of uh and then I, as, as well like that kind of you know like kind of uh id like kind of wink wink nod nod that we all knew that was going on and this kind of somehow kind of irish thing that's you know all okay and we're all okay with it but like who's benefiting from it, like, like, you know, very few people, what damage it is doing, you know, massive damage, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, like, you know, even, 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 kind of on, even kind of on that point, I mean, that kind of, like, that kind of post-colonial self-hatred <laughs> that we seem to, to kind of love here, um, like, Ireland's gaming industry, software kind of game kind of industry, it's a cottage industry. Which is in stunning given its its kind of successes, right? It's and it's still treated as a cottage kind of industry because the focus of Enterprise Ireland and the IDA is to bring in companies and give them kind of tax breaks. So you have our software, our software and uh, like industry that is actually quite that is quite good. Our gaming kind of industry, um, our animation, their industry as well, and our whole kind of. Um, cultural kind of um you know kind of uh, you know kind of sector yeah. you know in terms of tv shows which is not like uh, movies like i mean the amount of talent that's signing on in ireland and making films on the dole which is in just daft mm. you know but that's not seen as being investment getting a special purpose vehicle in that has a kind of shop value of like two trillion but doesn't employ anyone but some kind of uh, but it, it, it was a law firm will make hundreds of millions in fees from it. That's the focus. And it is actually like it's not it is part of the psyche. Like what if if you ever have the time, you, you should tune into the public accounts committee. Um I worked in a form of it for nearly five years and it was just fascinating in terms of seeing how the state thinks about itself and how it's like they genuine, those civil servants, they walk in and they genuinely think this is the best way forward. And it's just, it just has a grip on them. And you just see how the state thinks. There's no conspiracy. It's mm -hmm. all there. It just means kind of sitting down and actually kind of teasing the truth. So help comes in or, um, you know, or tourism. In, like no matter what kind of sector kind of comes in, you'll just see how it thinks about itself, its own its own kind of rationales, and it's kind of fascinating. I find it fascinating, anyway, but then I've no life, so. <laughs> um, I I would like to ask another question, but if someone else has something to say or make a comment, feel free. I might go right after you, Miguel. I'll, I'll let you go first. No, 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 please, go ahead. Oh, per perfect. Okay, well, um, I'll try to ask this really quickly. Um, this it's, might be a little more verbose than I'd like it to be, but um, I, I totally agree with your approach, Connor, in um, raising awareness to what capitalism currently looks at or perceives to be externalities, you know, in the mm -hmm. realm of, like, for example, like, you know, environmental uh, detriment. 
um, and social care. I think I was reading on the Nevin Institute that um, I think in relation to average earnings, Ireland has the second highest childcare uh, costs in the whole world, second only to the US, I believe. So uh, given what's happening now with um, uh, the state doing everything in its power to try to keep schools open, um, first of all, do you see this as a, a kind of a, a plaster over a bullet wound in the state trying to not... Uh, make it obvious how much parents across the country are so reliant on schools uh, in order to care for their children. And secondly, if so, as I believe it is, do you see any elements of, say, for example, a trade union movement or parties or anything like that, grassroots groups even, trying to build on that, on that, on that recent awareness that might, um, you know, that might kind of inspire some kind of a movement to try to um, accommodate for these childcare costs, or at least to raise awareness to them. Yeah, it's a yeah. I mean, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a huge kind of question on the on kind of child care kind of costs. Again, this goes back to um, what's seen as being kind of important in terms of finance in Ireland. So, what's seen as being an investment um, sideline from kind of child care because child care was always kind of privatized kind of more or less in Ireland or was done kind of in non kind of capitalist forms through through kind of um, families and like still is but we can get a sense of where they are in terms of nursing homes so um, back in 2005 2006 around 75 to 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 kind of 80 percent of all nursing homes in Ireland were public nursing homes and now it's 80 percent are private it's been flipped in in like 10 years. And those who were investors include people like James Riley, you know, who was an investor in, 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 in like nursing homes. So what you see, I think, is that indigenous Irish capital um, has very few outlets for investment here outside of um, housing and construction. Since 2008, when that blew up, um, they're very wary to go back into that. So the investment kind of strategies are they in social reproduction? Are, are they in those elements that you talked about? So they so they don't want to do a kind of state um, childcare service because that's one less investment kind of strategy for indigenous kind of Irish capital. Same as with um, nursing homes, and then you know same with uh, with um, hospitals. They're not interested in having a private system because um, there's no money in 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 actual healthcare. You want a private system. There's no money in 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 health. Health is a loss making business. All the money is in health insurance. That's how you make money from it. Nobody makes money from 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 uh, from looking after people. You make money from the insurance system. That's that's where you make money in in health. It's it's health insurance. So to keep that going, you need to have long kind of waiting lists. You need to have that way of like bringing people into either paying private or paying for kind of health insurance. Um, so we see these kind of these are the kind of tensions in terms of where finance in Ireland goes into. Um, so these are kind of social battles, you know, do you take on, um, you know, a capital, like a way of like taking on kind of Irish capital is by arguing for uh, 24 hour uh, crashes, but for arguing for that are state run that are, and, and free, you know, these are the ways like, even from like one, it makes social sense. Two, it makes sense even for kind of small businesses because it lowers kind of costs. And even for those who are full on kind of anti capitalist, this is your strike. If, if you want to hurt Irish capital, then you go after the daycare kind of, they, they continued privatization of care. Austerity is a feminist issue. I'm not the first person who has said that. I mean, but it is for these reasons, you know. Again, going back to just the importance of kind of feminist, of feminist economics, uh, are chipping away at that logic of the factory as the only uh, sphere of 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 profit for capitalism. 
it's not the home is as well yeah. oh yeah sorry i'm just on kind of parties and and uh and, and like trade unions no i don't see anything coming from them internally which is why it's very important for kind of grassroots movements uh, parties are open if there's pressure from outside but i don't see any any kind of ideas coming from internal to parties uh, not the mainstream ones anyway but a will from outside so i think that's where the importance of kind of community groups and 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 the grassroots groups really kind of kicks in because you can put external pressure on these kind of bodies i don't think it'll come from them themselves off their own steam that's great thanks a million mm -hmm. um, anyone could else? i just could i just um speaking of um you know the big companies and um that they don't employ a lot of people and um when they do employ people um it's often precarious work or bogus contracts um i i've been on those kind of contracts working for big multinationals um they 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 chase the the workers for for um um taxes and stuff like that revenue is more interested in in someone's individual taxes even though you know it, it's not even uh, a proper uh, contract and they don't do anything about the the companies that actually um do not follow the laws and the labor laws are pretty poor as well i think oh, no, no, it's, oh, it's terrible absolutely terrible they are they are they are like a, they're, they're 100 years out of date you know yeah, so that that's another issue I think with you know with these big corporations that come here because they can totally abuse that, especially not just on the Irish workforce, but there's a lot of these multinationals also bring a lot of international workers to Ireland who might not know anything about the labour laws or who are you know um, in in a more precarious situation even you know because they're abroad have no support systems etc. So. Um, there's a lot of issues around that as well that ties in with with all that so i just wanted to touch upon that and... no it's absolutely true and like you know even on that like, like i mean ida would not say how many people are employed by kind of multinational companies here even though they get all of the all of the prsi like payroll uh like numbers what they release are kind of guesstimates as to how many, which is staggering because they actually have the actual numbers and they won't release them. Um, so when they say that there's 400, that, that's 200,000 people working in FDI companies in Ireland, that's foreign kind of direct investment. But uh, what they won't mention is that they include Tesco's in that, they include Aldi. Um, you know, they'll include retail kind of services in that and i don't think aldi is what people think of when you think of foreign direct investment in, in, into ireland but we see the whole uh, manipulation of the figures to give lie well to, to kind of boost that lie that corporation tax is what is keeping ireland going um it's it's an element of it but yeah. But so's you know so's gaming you know so's so's kind of additional software you know. Okay, so any urgent question? Otherwise, I'll ask something and then I think we wrap it up. Is that okay? Okay, so Connor, um, there was I was particularly interested in this um in the point you made about the capitalist system being an extractive system which we yeah. kind of understand and realize um around the environment and the, and social reproduction and then you already touched upon the fact that home is also a space of exploitation not just a factory yeah so could you just elaborate about a little bit about your own thinking or your own trajectory in this sort of shift or emphasis on a more feminist approach, which seems to push um, and no longer a more feminist slash gender where gender exploitation is key. And then you also, you also briefly alluded to the fact that the mercantile system of the, in the West was uh, and the generation of wealth that led to the primitive accumulation that Marx speaks about is uh, based on the slave trade. 
mm. some on racial questions and bodies being ex exploited. So, but just within your trajectory and also in your work as an advisor to community groups and in unions and so on, how do you reconcile or how do you discuss this need to shift from a more traditional class analysis and to a more to this kind of more feminist eco-feminist approach where we see the spaces of exploitation being transitioned from the factory to the space of home or others where social reproduction is the key element yeah i mean um yeah it's it's a, it's a huge kind of question on on the um on on the feminist kind of part of it like going back to kind of Rosa and Luxembourg and then really with kind of a Maria kind of Mays in the 1970s, what they argue is, and what I, and what kind of, and what can really kind of clicks there with me is that primitive accumulation is still going on. So they applied that primitive extractive form of the slave trade and, and, and all, and of the kind of colonial kind of world. And they said, well, that's actually going on in terms of women in the so-called developed world. There's the same primitive accumulation that is going on. And then in the 1970s, that was then kind of um, expanded to bring in nature. Like, and that for me, like it just it just clicked. It's going, this makes so much sense. So um, so that so like for for one example of it, um, I do think that there's a lot written about financialization which is probably a bit bogus but um but there's one thing that if you look at going back to water about how like how was the household a, a sphere of of capitalist you know accumulation is it not just a cost that is kind of passed on well with kind of Irish water Irish water is kind of um it's 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 uh, it's all kind of set up was to privatize the income stream that was coming in from it. So what happened is that Irish water would go to the bond markets. It would sell kind of debt and that debt would be paid for through the funds that were coming in through those bills. So you're actually paying off the bonds by the bills that are, that, that are kind of coming through. In order for that to work, um, the bond markets needed to see a clearly identifiable income stream that was coming through. So that's your meters and that's your bills that, uh, that are coming through. It's also why the, uh, the state couldn't do with, with kind of Irish water bills what it did with the household charge, i.e. a move it into general taxation. If it did that, then there's no kind of bond markets are, are going to be um, interested. So we can see here that the 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 bill payment boycott um, really scuppered that whole profit seeking kind of strategy, that extractive kind of element from the um, from the, uh, the, the, the uh, from the kind of household. If you were to bring in a classic kind of Marxist uh, factory kind of production, like a commodity, the type kind of analysis, which I won't mention names, but a lot of kind of Marxist kind of groups in Ireland still kind of hold to that. You'd miss that. You'd miss the whole form of, 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 capital, of capital accumulation that was going on explicitly through the um, household. We see it now with, with elements with the kind of corporate kind of landlordism. Although I do think that that's a big kind of overblown. Um, but that was one example of it where you can see this, this, this kind of capitalist logic being brought in and tying the bond markets to your water bill. And once that was severed through a boycott of that payment, the whole game then was up. It could not bring it into the tax system because then it's not a clearly identifiable income stream for those bond in, you know, investors that's just one example for me of when you start to see how capital is working in in the 21st century when we start kind of seeing it wider than just the uh, factory floor so 
what are you working on at the moment so that we wrap up the session with uh with a more personal note yeah um, i'm i'm working on a book on the apple case okay. at the moment uh which 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 which, which, which is really a a 400 year history of finance in Ireland. <laughs> so, so it's going back to the 16th kind of century. Yeah. Um, but, but, but the reason being is that because capitalism is multi-generational, um, it's not renewed every kind of generation. It's not the Borg, you know, you know, it's like it actually, it, it lives and breathes intergenerationally. So we need to, observe it intergenerationally and how you do that is through history it's by using history as your canvas because only history gives you that canvas that's wide enough and deep enough to observe deep social forces in motion that to actually watch them move so we go back to the kind of compadre like my argument is that is that there's a form of of the capitalism in Ireland called a, a compadoc and a middleman kind of uh, capitalism um, that's actually been kind of utilized in Eastern Europe since around 1990 as well. So since the fall of the Berlin Wall, we can see Hungary and Poland and the, and the kind of Czech Republic, um, the EU trying to shape those former Eastern Bloc kind of countries into the Irish model. There's been some resistance, you know, especially in like Hungary now, where, where it's been a big kind of, it's a right wing kind of backlash, but it is a backlash there on them. Um, but you can see that same kind of template as to kind of using these kind of countries as kind of middlemen kind of stuff. It's a it's a colonial it's a it's a, it's a, it's a colonial kind of template, but because most kind of English speaking kind of Marxism has come from the center, has come from either Britain or the U.S., there's a blind spot with those kind of Marxisms in terms of actually looking at, you know, how, how kind of capitalism, the, the ingenuity of the, of the so-called like peripheral class in tapping into kind of worldwide kind of capitalism. And Ireland's been quite good at it. Um, Ireland, like neoliberalism didn't arrive in Ireland in the 1980s. The rest of the world caught up with Ireland in the 1980s and we just said what took you so long going back to kind of uh like mike is i'm sure i hope I, I i've said your name right uh yeah. you know you know our 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 labor laws are so weak because they've always been weak they weren't you know they were they, they were weakened a bit in like 1990 but they've always been weak because it's always been what's now seen as being neoliberal so how did that happen? So there's something strange with Ireland in terms of its position in like global in global in global in global capitalism that I think opens up kind of new ways of seeing it, especially for kind of what's seen as kind of former Eastern European kind of countries, and the role of the EU as a as an you know as it moves towards an internal kind of colonial empire kind of template, which was used in the Russian kind of federation. And, and in Britain and in the kind of UK as well. The EU is slowly kind of copying that kind of model. I'm now ranting, I'm sorry, because the no, Gavassi Bermi book. Uh, <laughs> no, you, you are not. I mean, uh, I, I, I was once, I was once, I, like I once gave this kind of talk to GUE NGL, or sorry, it's GUE, um, it's, the, it's the kind of left block in, in the European Parliament, and um, and there's you know there's there, there, there's left wing groups there for or or or, or 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 like MEPs from Germany and from Greece and Portugal and from France, and I said and said I said it says we're your future. Our past is your future. You should be very very worried. Unlike ye, we know what it's like to be part to be nominally independent but to be part of a foreign concurrency system which which Ireland was with sterling from 1817 until 1979 like we're part of the sterling kind of area we know what it's like to have that kind of even kind of independent but still kind of colonial kind of uh, yeah, like set up in a in a single kind of currency 
you know. And they all just they all just kind of laughed at me. He says, "Oh, you know, you know, here's yours talking about talking about you know, they're about their 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 eight hundred years again." I was going, "No," it says, "We're your future. We know what this looks like, <laughs> and you should be very very worried because we've we we've been here, pal. Our history is your future, and you should be very very worried." Uh, well, I think we will end up now, but <laughs> on, I, that, on that high note, <laughs> no, but I am committing here that to, uh, we will invite Connor to come back and speak about some other things, because I think each slide of the presentation today and each of the question today could be a talk on its own. And I am just imagining how we can frame that in the future. Um, I mean, I don't even know what to say how to thank you for all this illuminating conversation um it, i just hope that it makes sense because i because with kind of covid as well i spend a lot of time just talking to myself so i make sense to me no i, I just hope, I just hope that I, I i i i make sense to other humans still no, it makes sense to me i mean this is just a personal note uh, recently in the portuguese press there were maybe seven articles written by the former director of the main newspaper uh, where she started by talking about some sort of Instagram post from the, a new party called Liberal Party and um, where they basically say Ireland is the model, Ireland is the example Portugal should follow. Right. And she tried to deconstruct that series, of that, that kind of narrative through a series of research and she wrote it and I was just thinking about, you know, like how I became even more familiar with some of the questions that surround Ireland, Irish financial and well, economic system by reading that. But on the other hand, what you just said about uh, neoliberal ideas in the right year in the 70s or 80s, we, you know, Ireland was already that, that, you know, I, I, I have that impression when I got here, like it seems that it's kind of maybe since the foundation of the state or even, I don't know, but before that, but somehow I had that feeling, all this is so already here and we are seeing the, this kind of extreme forms of that. So I think what was important in, your conver in our conversation today is, is the tools that you share that enable us to you know, have a better sense of the reality that surround us that somehow we might not be able to see. And I believe there is a lot to unpack here. So it's, there will be, you know, all of you that attended today and, and others will have an opportunity to hear you speaking more. But um, I would like to conclude just for thank you, Connor and everyone. Oh, thanks for having me. For, for this fantastic uh, uh, conversation. And those of you who are interested, <coughs> Sirius is launching tomorrow a new artwork that by a collective called Soft Day, well, not a collective, but a duo, a duo, a duo of artists called Soft Day, where they discuss it, uh, where they discuss quite interesting questions around the fight by local community groups against the proposal for an incinerator in, in Cove, well, in Cove, in County Cork. And on Thursday, we resume a series of conversations um, that somehow have parallel and intersecting uh, questions with the talk of today. It's a, it's a series of conversations that we've called uh, reframing community-based economies where we are discussing the works of some scholars, including Catherine Gibson, and who has a book called Take Back the Economy and somehow feels uh, it fits within this eco-feminist kind of approach to economy. So we are resuming this also at 7 p.m. So in case when any of you are interested in joining us on that event or tomorrow at 5 p.m. and in following events, you can find us on our Instagram at Series Art Center. You'll find the link tree link where you can find all the information where you can register. Um, and those of you who are interested, you can always get in touch with us um, to either sign up to our e-bulletin or or any other ideas, suggestions, and there will be more, more events in the near future. We are also launching um, a reading group in, two, in three weeks time where we'll discuss key texts by philosophers who wrote uh, since the last year until, to to, until today around questions surrounding inequality that re-emerged within the context of COVID-19. So somehow all these 
events and conversations are a constellation of ideas and, and practices that we are trying to bring together and share so that we can contribute as an arts organization to a more discursive and, and progressive um, understanding of the world in which we live. Okay. All right. So thank you so much. And we'll see each other at some point. Um, have a nice evening and until soon. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. You. Thanks, Clark.